good, good morning. Thank you very much for asking me to come and speak today. It's, um, it's a real privilege to be here as an infection control nurse specialist. Um, is there any others in the room out of interest? No, I didn't think there would be. Um, so <laughs> it's always nice to be, uh, to be invited to sessions like this because especially as infection control is sometimes um, uh, an element of uh, discussion and, uh, well, it doesn't always go smoothly, I think, when you approach infection control nurses. Um, so I'm hoping I'll change your opinion of that. I'm going to move my stop clock to the floor because I'm... So. Okay, so, yes, uh, I'm from Leeds and uh, Community Healthcare, NHS Trust. I've been in the team for about 10, 11 years, so have uh, some, hopefully, uh, good practice that has been built up over years of experience. Um, and I'm pleased that I work in the community because it's such a um, different world in comparison to, to acute infection control. Um, and the reason why it's really good to be here today, I suppose, is just to focus on the fact that, um, you know, the social environment um, is, is ever-changing, and as are the patients that we're seeing out and about in the community setting. Um, and I suppose to put it into context, it's about infection control and also the hygiene in patients' homes is becoming more and more increasingly important. And I suppose one of the fundamental drivers is that hygiene plays such an important role part in tackling antibiotic resistance, which we've already heard um, briefly about this morning. Um, it's also prompted by concerns about the growing numbers of people um, who are going to be at greater risk of different types of infections and that are being cared for in their own homes and, and also within, within adult social care. And it's estimated that approximately one in five or more people in the community are at an increased risk of infection. So we need to people basically to understand um, how by reducing infections and home in home and community settings they can reduce pressures on their local health services and we've heard already this morning from Alan about how obviously we've got the very um, imminent changing landscape and have I suppose for a number of years now around the NHS and what that really means for us as nurses and, and healthcare workers um, and about how I suppose we're going to rely more on family um, as well as our care agencies to look after people. Um, and one thing that I suppose I want really for you to go home with us today is about the different infection control policies um, that you maybe should be aware of. And I'm sure you already are through your normal Statman training routes through work. But it's also about the emphasis about infection control being absolutely everyone's responsibility. Um, and it's not just yours as healthcare workers, as nurses, as AHPs, as medics. It's, you know, even our volunteers that are coming into the leg clubs and as well as um, people within our community setting, our volunteers, our members, and about how we can influence them. So, let's have a look. I'm hoping my paper doesn't distract. If it does, then do say. So the learning objectives really today are for us to discuss about the current challenges relating to infection control, the relevant policy, having a think about the microbial world that we, that we live in and how that impacts on us really as human beings, a brief little bit about the chain of infection and how really our infection control practices can break that chain, and the principles that we need to think about around, you know, within our, with our, within our leg club settings and a small overview as well about the antimicrobial resistance and how this is going to potentially threat um, the society that we live in. So, infection control, is it simple? Anyone have any challenges? Is it as simple as washing your hands? No. Give me some ideas, give me a shout out about what you find some of the challenges out there in your leg clubs. Yeah. Yeah, so washing of hands, I couldn't quite hear, you'll have to shout up. Washing of hands. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. And, and even from our own area, we've just recently set up the Otley Leg Club in the last, well, since March it opened its doors. And I went along and did an audit a number of weeks ago. And they were getting the water to soak legs from the hot water tap in the kitchen, um, which I kind of 
almost fell over, uh, well, I think they all fell over my jaw dropping to the floor, really. Um, but even, you're right, even hand hygiene. So it's about just the knowledge and awareness, isn't it, I suppose, of the volunteers and also the staff that are going to be there. What else? What are we all short of? I know I am. And I'm sure, yeah, time is a huge factor, isn't it, in, in our everyday working lives. And I think it's something that certainly for, you know, community district nurses and caseloads absolutely going through the roof. And, it, and by working with this model, it means that then we can hopefully reduce the visits to patients' homes. So hopefully infection control isn't going to be such an element of a time factor or a problem. What else? What a yes, definitely. And, th and that isn't a particularly easy thing. I know for us in Otley, we have bags that are then disposed of in the local practices. Some establishments might have bins, waste bins that are attached to the building that the, can, that the waste can go into. But it isn't as quite straightforward as, as just disposing it as it would be in your normal clinical setting. And it's obviously sitting uh, in with the, the correct requirements with HSE as well. What else? What about the patient? They sometimes can pose as a slight challenge, can't they? We sometimes might have the expert patient coming in through the door and they'll maybe tell you what needs to be put on their leg and that can sometimes throw you, can't it? It's not always um, you know, an easy, easy way of working. So there's plenty of challenges out there and, and hopefully we're going to, to put some of those at ease today. So you will no doubt be familiar with this document. Is there anybody that isn't? So this is my Bible, really. The Health and Social Care Act came out in 2008. And, uh, and this was basically how I interpret it as a, uh, re a response from the Department of Health around the heightened numbers of MRSA levels that we were seeing and C. diff cases in the uh, late 90s, early noughties. And this document is a code of practice and it really emphasizes about everybody's res um, responsibility for infection control. <laughs> In hand with that, we then have a very nice document, which is a number of years old now, um, but the evidence hasn't particularly changed, and this has a number of authors that are very um, particular, Heather, Heather Loveday um, and Jenny Wilson, who are two kind of authors really are, you know, high on the agenda for infection control. And the EPIC-3, again, reinforces the evidence that is then displayed in the Health and Social Care Act, and to go in hand with this as well, which I'm sure will all be at some point of uh, being visited by CQC. Um, and obviously for us working off NICE guidelines. So infection control is certainly my passion. Um, I'd imagine yours is tissue viability or wound prevention and wound, wound care. But for me, the Health and Social Care Act is, a, is an absolute Bible for covering all of the elements of infection control and ultimately providing the safe quality care that we're wanting for our, for our healthcare economies. So putting infection control into perspective. Now, normally when I talk about this in our own organisation, one of the things that I really focus on is sepsis, which is a, another real passion of mine. Um, and I normally show a video about, about a patient who is kind of middle-aged, had gone into the hospital for a very routine operation. And he was, I think, in his 40s. He'd gone home, and, and he really deteriorated very, you know, his wife was very much of the opinion that it just wasn't right. There was something there that wasn't right. And she phoned for an ambulance, and she said, I'm really sorry to even ring you right now. I just feel this is a real waste of a phone call, but my husband just isn't well. He had kind of a low-grade temperature, well, and he was fitting kind of um, increased respiratory rate and was very drowsy and just didn't really look well. He ended up going into hospital, and he was and he was septic. He ended up in intensive care, and a chap uh, some of you might have heard of Ron Daniels, who is the the founder of the Sepsis Trust, who was a relatively new consultant in post at the time, spoke to Karen, his wife, and said, "I'm really sorry, but your husband isn't going to make it. He has severe brain damage." And she said, "Well, on what level is he brain damaged?" And he was like, well, "He won't recognise the children." And and this, I think, that most people can completely relate to um, in terms of, for me, it was thinking about, gosh, if I was in this woman's shoes, I don't know how I would, how I would cope with this. Um, but I suppose what I'm trying to get across to you is that sepsis impacts on, actually, on potentially anybody. And I was looking for some evidence to relate to, to uh, leg ulcers. And you'd be pleased to know that actually sepsis, the presentation of certainly a sepsis associated with leg ulceration, is rare which is good, which is probably music to our ears, I should imagine. 
Um, however, there has been recent cases where it illustrates a typical presentation of a venous ulcer with an active group A streptococcal infection and toxic shock. So it does happen, albeit rare. But again, another factor of what I'd love for you to take home is just to, to think about sepsis and for it to be at the forefront of your mind. Because obviously, the leg club will be a proportion of your work, and obviously, as in your day jobs, it will go much wider. And it's thinking about the patients that are potentially at risk. Um, so these are just some of the, I mean, this is from BBC, kind of, it's just displaying about facts about health workers um, helping patients stay at home. It's about we've got NHS England thinking about the five year forward view in terms of the model working so beautifully with the integration of the system in terms of, you know, how we're going forward and how, how the landscape will change and thinking about sepsis as well. Um, and, you know, it, it does impact on patients' lives hugely. And, and that's really a big part of what I want to get over today. And thinking, of, I suppose, about the burden of healthcare associated infections, we know that on average there is 300,000 patients a year in England that are affected by HCAIs. So historically, you might be aware of it being called hospital acquired infection. Over probably the last 10 years, this has changed to healthcare associated infection, and it completely represents the fact that our patients are much more transient. We are keeping so many more patients at home. We're completely embracing social care. So it isn't just about this hospital-acquired uh, infection. It's about the fact that you can pick up an infection wherever you go, obviously, if you're particularly immunocompromised. In 2007, MRSA bloodstream infections, Clostridium difficile infections were recorded as the underlying causes of um, or contributing factors in approximately 9,000 deaths in hospitals and primary care. Now, this evidence is relatively old, isn't it? Um, I suppose what I would want to say here is that actually we are seeing huge you know, reduction figures in, in the likes of MRSA and, and C. diff as well. And what really is emerging at the moment and what the Department of Health and organisations throughout England are really focusing on is about the E. coli um, presentation that we're seeing throughout many population groups within our healthcare economies. And, and that's talking about not your E. coli 0157 that you might pick up from, say, a petting farm. This is about your E. coli gram-negative bacteria that presents, presents in perhaps wound sites, urinary tract infections, and so on. Um, so I suppose really when we look at data, it's about potentially patients that are going to be coming over the threshold into leg clubs. Um, and also thinking about healthcare associated infections in terms of the burden about financially, it costs the NHS in excess of probably one billion a year, which is obviously a huge, huge amount. Um, and there we go, 56 million of this is estimated to be incurred after patients have been discharged from hospitals. Okay, so, so in the spotlight, I suppose thinking about the different types of pathogens that we might come into contact with. In Leeds, we use um, System 1, and I'm presuming that there'll be a number of you in the room that have got access to System 1. Is that right? Yes? Yeah? Um, and we also use a system called PPM Plus, which is bespoke to Leeds. Um, in infection control in the community, we get alerted about when a patient has been discharged with a recently acquired MRSA infection. So this isn't a bloodstream infection, this is just that they're colonized with it. And infection control, we then put this onto system one so we can hopefully forewarn. Because if you're sitting here and you're gonna to say to me that you probably get alerted about every MRSA that comes into the community by your local acute trust, I'd imagine that probably is not true. Um, but we know that there's one in four in the population that are colonized with MRSA. There'll be a proportion of you in this room that are colonized with MRSA, but it doesn't cause us any problems because we're all fit and healthy and, and well and young. Look at you, you're all young. So it doesn't cause us any issues. Um, but obviously the patients that we've got coming in through the leg club doors are a very you know, different category here. And these are the potentially those that are going to be immunocompromised, whether it's through age, whether it's through other underlying chronic diseases, whether they're diabetic, and this is where it can potentially become more threatening. And the fact in itself that they've got an open wound, and if they're colonized with MRSA, it hasn't been picked up, it hasn't been treated, what we don't want to see is a bloodstream infection where it ends up becoming fatal. Um, also thinking about the likes of C. diff, again, a clostridium spore, um, how I describe it 
which some of you might not appreciate, is like a minstrel. It's a rod-shaped spore with a hard outer shell coating. Very hard to kill unless you're using a bleach agent or something like Difficile S. Um, and again, this can take quite a period of time to die in the atmosphere. So we'll come on to the times later on. And we've got lots of different emerging antibiotic-resistant organisms, CPE, vancomycin-resistant enterobactase. We've got various different ones that are out there. And you know, as we've already alluded to, this is a concern for the healthcare economy. It's a concern for us as individuals um, because we don't really know obviously, where this is going to end up in the next, certainly probably in our lifetimes, about the increased resistance that we're seeing that's coming in through oral consumption from antibiotics, but also through the food chain as well. Norovirus, I'm sure that probably a good proportion of you in the room have had norovirus. You can have the best hand hygiene in the world if you orally uh, inhale norovirus spores, it'll, it'll have the better of you. And we've got head lice and we've got influenza and we're approaching obviously the flu season. I don't know about you, but we're starting our campaign next week. Um, the Department of Health or Public Health England wants to vaccinate 100% staff, uh, which is a tad unrealistic, I feel. But uh, it's encouraging. And again, those of you who maybe feel strongly about not having the vaccine, it's remembering that you can be the carrier of flu and pass it on to your mu more immunocompromised patients that you're coming across or members that you're coming across in, in the leg clubs. So we know there's lots of different pathogens. We know that it's, it's not quite as straightforward as hand hygiene. There's lots of different elements that go towards this. So in terms of your infection control responsibility, as a qualified professional, you do have that responsibility there. It's ensuring that you're up to date with the current policies, the guidance and procedures. Now, all of your local organizations will have an absolute bundle of infection control policies. Um, it seems to be probably, I feel, always in an unjust way. We always have a huge volume to go through every, every few years. So really utilize your local policies as well as the policies that are on the Leg Club website. It's also about making you up to date with training. Um, it's about having a, a great partnership with your local infection control team, inviting them to come along to meeting, you know, to your Leg Clubs. Can I just have a quick show of hands? Do you have, an, do, out of you here, do you have a, an infection control nurse that comes along regularly to your meetings, to the, to the Leg Clubs? So I've got one, two, three, three people in the room, four, five. So out of you all, it's actually not, not really a huge number. So I'd really encourage you to go back and, and invite them to come along. Now, you're probably sitting there going, well, yes, if we do that, then they might uh, come along with some bad news for us. And, and hopefully what I'm going to go on to say is about being, I'm hoping we're going to see some pragmatism from them to you. Uh, hopefully wishful thinking, but I, I do hope that that would happen. And it's also about your responsibility, about understanding that it is everyone's responsibility for infection control, which I know I've harped on about, but I can't emphasize it enough. So I was invited here today to talk to you about what the policies are. Now, for me, uh, these are the ones that I feel are most important for you to have a good overview of. So we're thinking about standard infection control precautions, ensuring that hand hygiene is adhered to, that you bear below the elbow, that we're encouraging perhaps the volunteers as well to be bare below the elbow when they're in practice. Looking at cleaning, so the devices that you've got there, the equipment that you're using and the, the cleaning um, equipment that you've got in use. Um, thinking about the healthcare waste management and disposal, which I know we've already touched on, but we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit more detail. Um, thinking about aseptic technique, uh, making sure that you've had some up-to-date training with aseptic technique, um, because we often find that if you haven't got um, a WASP, does anybody use WASPs, a watch dissimulated? I can never remember what it stands for, if anyone can help me out. It's a competency-based tool, um, that's what we use locally, um, because often there is a, de a, deal, a great deal of comp uh, complacency that can come in here with aseptic technique. Uh, thinking about local decontamination of other types of reusable or medical, medical equipment. And the other one I thought maybe might be useful is about just reassociating or rethinking about your food safety policy as well and something that can be shared with the volunteers that are there. So again, the emphasis is about looking at what you've got locally, looking at what's on the Leg Club website, and also using me as a resource as well as the consultant advisor for the charity. So if the answers aren't there, then I'm always happy to respond to emails as and when. So what's the role of your infection control nurse locally? Well, when we've recently set up Otley, I was really keen to get involved with it right from the beginning. And 
Um, I think to the joy of the CCG, they were quite happy because I think that many of them kind of thought, wow, we, we actually thought you'd be the one that would say no to this. And so we looked at a couple of venues initially and I know that the model works. So the work is done with me. You don't have to persuade me about, about it. What I just need to make sure is that we're ensuring that safe quality care is delivered to the patients in the right setting. Now, we have an interesting venue in Otley. Um, it's a, it needs a bit of work on it. And I let them settle in for a number of months, actually, before I went to do an audit. And there was quite a few things that came out from the audit. And we've kind of come back to the conclusion of where we've got health and safety involved, because there's a few things I wanted them to have a look at. And we're not saying, no, this can't continue. It's about, if it's not right, we'll look for somewhere else. There's no need for this to stop. Um, and, and I think that's maybe where I've come across infection control nurses, colleagues within, within the country who've kind of maybe not had this, some pragmatism. Um, I'm not suggesting they'll be there with a bottle of red, but there's something about, we know the model works, we know that this fits in well in terms of the changing landscape, we know that this supports you as nurses, it marries together the education, and at the end of the day, you have a group of patients or members that are coming here that go home happy. And that means that we've got to make it work regardless. We've got to find the right venue. We've got to make sure that the systems are in place. And I think sometimes for me, my experience locally within my own organization, where the stumbling blocks are being, blocks are being put in place is about the lack of knowledge and the lack of knowing about why this works so well. And often these people haven't gone along to a leg club and had that tingly sensation on their arms and gone, oh my goodness, this is amazing, coming away and seeing the impact this has on people's lives. So do, do invite your local infection control teams to come along. So I suppose this to me was just about an example. This is a, the picture at the bottom is, is, our, is in Otley. And the two top ones are an example, I suppose, of a patient's home and the clinical setting. And it's different, it's different. All three are very different. The top one is clinical, and, and that's as we would expect it to be. This is, this is the gold standard as what I would expect to see in a GP practice. Um, and you can see on the floor here, uh, the bottom picture, we've got nursing staff there who are kneeling. At the moment, we're using a vinyl matting. They kneel on there, they clean it down after use. And I suppose what I'm trying to say is that the environment is very different, but we shouldn't let that get necessarily in the way. And it's about having the right resources there and the right education and training to support what we're doing. So things to consider for, us, for, for the right environment. Okay. Link in with the IPC team, link in with health and safety. For me, the health and safety person that came along was really supporting what I was saying in terms of what to look out for that complements the policies that are in place. Cleaning of the environment is something about, for me, um, we went along, I audited the premises, I found a mop that had rust on. Uh, so that would maybe be a bit of a telltale sign that they haven't got a very good cleaning schedule in the premises. Disposal of dirty water, it's fine to go down a toilet, we maybe just don't use that toilet during that period of, uh, of the clinic, of the, of the collect leg club uh, period. And we clean it after use, obviously, uh, before we leave the premises. If they've got a sluice hopper or a janitorial unit, then that's even better. Um, but it can also can be disposed of down a drain as well, if needs be. What you don't want is for people to be pouring it down hand wash basins, um, which, you know, I've come across practice nurses where they haven't got a sluice hopper. It's been poured down a hand wash basin. And if we have a patient that's uh, colonized with pseudomonas in their leg wound, that we then see the water supply that then is colonized and then you go to wash your hands and you end up with, your ha with it on your hands. So it's thinking outside the box. You don't have to have a janitorial unit. That would be maybe the gold standard, but this isn't a clinical setting. We've got to do the best with what we've got. And hand hygiene facilities. So the NICE guidelines very much emphasize the use of alcohol gel. And, and you'll be aware of, no doubt, the World Health Organization's five moments of hand hygiene. Um, and it's about having access to what you need. So have the toggles on your pockets with the alcohol gel. Have a hand wash basin that you can use. So what we're not wanting to do is to go into a kitchen area to decontaminate hands. Um, and some things that you can potentially look at are teal um, as a provider, as, an, as a loose example, as, an, as a provider of a um, 
movable hand wash basin that's often used in military bases. And that's maybe something to, you know, to consider if hand hygiene is a real problem within the area that you are. But alcohol gel, unless your hands have organic matter on or are you're dealing with a patient potentially that has had norovirus or C. diff, which I'm hoping they've stayed at home, but just in case, then alcohol gel is a, is a, is a very good product to use. And in terms of waste disposal, it's again liaising with your local infection control team, whether there's the bins there that can be used to dispose of items into, the big bins that are outside, or whether you arrange a transport system that takes it from the premises back to a local GP practice in that way. There's no clear-cut answer in terms of the route of disposal. What I'm trying to say is that you really just need to make sure you're disposing of your clinical waste into the right stream, and then it's about having that partnership within the local economy to decide of the best way to get, then get that to, to an, a collection point. And storage of equipment is an interesting one because often when you're at these venues, no for us in Otley, it's been a bit of a tricky one. Um, we obviously we're renting the space off somewhere, off somebody, off some landlord. So it's, you know, for me I would like a timber unit there with everything in and it's just maybe treading softly in the early days before we can do that. But what you're not wanting is to have any equipment that's potentially at risk of becoming contaminated. So having things perhaps in storage boxes, perhaps having those drawers with the, you know, the plastic drawers where you can store items in, whether you've got access to TAMBA units or anything like that is great. And, and liaise with your local you know, trusts. We've just managed to get hold of some high back chairs that were going spare in the organisation, so we went to estates and, and poached them. And do the same perhaps with your local areas. Um, because there's always no doubt, you know, the likes of wardrobes and storage units that are, that are spare that can perhaps be used. Oh, and educating volunteers. So we haven't yet, but what I'm hoping to do in the future is to do some hand hygiene sessions with our volunteers just to make it, you know, for, for them to have an, an, a knowledge base of it. You know, the people that we have got volunteers, not Lee, haven't got particularly much experience in healthcare. So it's just good to remind them, those that are sitting on the desk, as and when they wanted to, obviously, to do hand hygiene and understanding potential risks. So my, the hard thing for me here was when giving information back to, for instance, the landlords. For them, it's a venue. They have patients coming in, just like they do the luncheon club. For me, because we've got patients within, you know, some indwelling devices, we've got patients with open leg wounds, it's about trying to share the risk with others that we're, that we're liaising with. Right, I need to hurry up, I think, because time's ticking on, sorry. Um, so risks and vulnerabilities. The people that are going to be coming through the door are certainly going to be at some degree of risk. Here we've got a chap with an indwelling device. We've got somebody that's gone through um, hemodialysis. Us, as healthcare workers, are somewhat at risk. Um, and also the patients, I suppose, are at risk of us, if I mentioned earlier on about, say, if we were carriers of influenza. Um, but we know that the immune system certainly weakens with age, and we know that obviously elderly patients are much more likely to develop infections. Um, we know that obviously older people have weakened uh, cough reflexes and, so ch and obviously chest muscles, which obviously increases their risk of chest infections um, and so on, but also the s more serious um, uh, infections, particularly pneumonia. Um, and, it's, and, you know, it's not always easy, is it, to deal with the you know, the different types of vulnerable, you know, people that we've got coming through the door. But I think it's just having that knowledge and awareness that actually who we've got coming in, majority of which are probably going to be over 65, majority of which will have some of the chronic underlying um, illnesses, diseases. Um, and it's about what we can do to uh, reduce any risks to them in terms of, you know, having a healthcare associated infection. You might be aware of the chain infection. Normally it's a chain. I don't like the chain. I prefer a fancier option. So I've gone for a flower. Uh, so... It's about really here, it's about thinking about how we're going to break the chain of infection. And as infection control is everyone's responsibility, it's about basically uh, breaking these links apart. Um, for me, in terms of a microorganism or a pathogen, it's about having that um, early detection. We've already talked about the uh, Smith and Nephew, um, remind me of the name. My moleculite, that's right. Um, which is a fantastic device to use. Um, Unfortunately, it'll be an expensive um, item to use, um, but it does give us that early, earlier intelligence, um, and that means that then we can get antibiotics started, and perhaps until, if we are going to take a swab, then we await um, any, any uh, sensitivities that come back so we can ensure that the patient is on the right antibiotic. 
In terms of reservoir, we're all a reservoir. The person sitting next to you is a reservoir. The air that you're breathing in is a reservoir. The bed you slept on last night was a reservoir. Um, and sometimes there isn't a lot we can do about that, but certainly your hands are reservoirs, and we can do something about that. Um, and it's about ensuring that we do have really good hand hygiene. Um, it's not rocket science. It's quite simple, really, isn't it? But um, for volunteers, they, might, they probably won't have a knowledge about doing an eight-stage technique. Um, and, and why would they? Uh, because generally people socially don't. It's probably only us that, as healthcare workers, have it absolutely drummed in um, from, from the likes of myself, going around doing hand hygiene audits and swabbing your hands with ACP machines and so on. Um, but the areas where we're working in terms of the leg club is the reservoir. You know, they're all very different entities and it's about reducing the risk where we can. So whether that's cleaning, whether that's the storage of your equipment, um, the hand hygiene, the people coming in, uh, there's, there's lots of different elements there. We have an entry and we have an, entry and we have a, an exit point. So some of you might have seen, well, you, you possibly might not be as sad as me, but there's a very good video on YouTube called Vomiting Larry. And it's an anaeresis doll that's filled with UV fluid and they make it throw up everywhere. They send a cleaner in to clean it up, who they do a very good job, but not that good because then they get a UV light and actually the splash is everywhere. So it doesn't have to be norovirus, it can be anything, because a patient will no doubt leave some degree of trail behind them, whether it's skin cells that are on the floor after you've uh, taken a dressing down, whether it's um, anything that, you know, anything potentially, I suppose. But what I'm trying to say is that cleaning is an important element to the efficiency of a leg club. Um, and, you know, in terms of an entry, um, you know, the wound itself, um, you know, if we haven't done the correct hand, hand hygiene, if we haven't got the right, correct devices, if we haven't got the correct wound dressings, and we're not protecting the wound site, then essentially th we're then going to um, allow different types of pathogens to work their way in. Um, and for those that are susceptible hosts, that then can be a problem. In terms of mode of transmission and backtracking here, but we're very good transmitters. We work very well at that. Um, you know, the door handles that you touch going in and out of the clubs, the bags that you use, the kneeling mats if you use them, um, the, we use those big, I um, don't know if I had one on the picture, um, I shouldn't have maybe done this, but you see you have the big uh, blue bin on the floor there. Um, the number of times that I go there and, and people don't clean them out with a disinfectant wipe afterwards, um, which I know it's had a plastic bag in, but you're still going to potentially get some drippage in between. So it's all about breaking the chain, it's doing what we can to break the chain, and it's about ensuring that we are keeping patients safe. We've talked about hand hygiene. This is obviously isn't a clinical hand wash basin. This is about uh, what you're going to potentially find maybe in your church hall or the setting where you're going to. It's not perfect, uh, but there's facilities there to wash your hands and there's facilities there for your volunteers and your members to wash their hands as well. Mm. Um, in terms of hands, it's risky business really, isn't it? Because uh, these are all the potential things we're going to touch. We've got floors, we've got pets. We know that dogs are very good carriers of MRSA. Um, we've got potentially water. We know the water we're going to be soaking our legs in. And um, you know, in our buildings, in our Leeds community, in our buildings for, such as Leeds Community Healthcare or the NHS buildings you work out of, there'll be a Legionella risk assessment. So, has your committee have they approached the landlords of the building to find out if there's been a Legionella risk assessment completed? Um, again. We don't particularly see huge problems, but we have seen over the years, you might remember the Baron Furnace outbreak uh, that, okay, came through air conditioning, but again, this is something that, you know, we need to make sure our patients are safe. So if you're going into a building, you maybe haven't had the water run through, turn the taps on, give them a good run through for a good 10 minutes and get any potential buildup of pathogens that are in the pipework so that you're using hopefully some good fresh water when soaking legs. Mm. Um, this, I suppose, really is just about, you know, the future is in our hands, um, literally, isn't it, in terms of going forward. Um, now, this is, this is an interesting one. I'm currently on a working group with NHS Improvement about looking at hand hygiene. I can take or leave five moments because I think there's a real point. There's a real, there's a, it isn't always used everywhere, and I don't think people always have the true understanding of it. Now, it's really simple, five moments of hand hygiene. I suppose a leg club is a classic place where you can be instilling it. Um, it's before you're seeing your patient, obviously before mm -hmm. you're doing any aseptic technique, afterwards, after touching the patient, and also when leaving the patient's surroundings. Um, I'd expect this to potentially change over the next few years. I think that things might start to alter.
and these are the, no doubt the most common areas that are missed as well during hand hygiene. And you'll see the reference there, 1978, unfortunately in the, what are we, 40 years, I don't think a great deal's changed, and those probably are still some of the high risk areas. I'm not going to go through this, you'll probably be familiar with the hand hygiene technique, no. but you no doubt have come across this before, a good environment where, nice breeding ground there, good overflow, where we're going to get pathogens that are going to thrive, got teacups and all sorts, and what we don't want is for you to go and wash your hands there, or fill up buckets to, sh to soak leg ulcers. Um, so it's just about making sure that the areas, particularly in the kitchens, are kept clean and also uh, with getting water from the most appropriate setting. So personal protective equipment, it's about thinking about the policies that you've got in place. It's thinking about the equipment you've got in your leg clubs. It's about thinking about whether you need any more equipment. I'm certainly not suggesting you need to uh, gown up with a high-vis suit when seeing patients, but it is just about whether you need any additional protection, if there's any risks to face, splashing and so on whether you need any eye protection or masks. But realistically, I think masks, uh, fate, sorry, aprons and gloves are more than sufficient. So thinking about how clean is clean. Well, from my recent experience, it wasn't great, but we're working on that and it will become great. Um, but what we don't want is this. Any ideas what it is? You all will have some right now. Yeah, biofilm. Where will you have it? Yeah when you tongue across your teeth. That's where your biofilm would be right now. What we don't want is biofilms, and I'm not here to talk about biofilms and weirds, I'm here to talk about on surfaces, the equipment that you're using. If you use an alcohol wipe on a surface, you'll then potentially end up with a biofilm in between that will end up uh, giving the perfect environment for pathogens to multiply and, uh, and thrive. Um, and that's where using your universal wipes comes in. We know, so on here, I haven't got a red light, unfortunately, but for me, the ones that are worrying, I suppose, would be the likes of your Klebsiella, your Pseudomonas, and I suppose your Staph aureus. So Staph aureus can potentially live for seven days or up to seven months in an environment. That's quite a long time. So if you see some high dust somewhere, odds are that might have a little bit of MRSA. And your viruses will live even longer. HIV won't, it's a very fragile virus. As soon as it's airborne, it won't live for any great length of time. But the likes of hepatitis, if you have a blood spillage in any of your environment, you need to make sure you've got the spill kits there to make sure you can clean it away properly. Hepatitis can certainly live up to potentially six or seven months if it isn't cleaned away from a hard surface. So we're thinking about the different wipes that you're using, antibi antimicrobial, uh, but for me it's about disinfectant wipes. Um, there's various different ones out there on the market, and what we're wanting to do is to break that, uh, that seal, I suppose. We're not wanting to have a biofilm, and we're wanting to protect patients and obviously healthcare workers. These are the ones that we use. I'm not here for Gamma, but this is just what we've tried in Leeds, and this works for us. This is a Clinelle Universal Wipe. So you don't want a detergent. A detergent's nice, it'll clean it, but it won't properly clean it. Almost a bit like bleach when you throw it down a toilet, it'll make it nice and white, but unless you scrub it, it won't kill all the different types of pathogens that are there residing. Also, mops. It's a tricky one, really, when it comes to leg clubs. I'm not, I'm not imagining they're going to have a, a nice rack there with all four different mops on, but we are wanting to make sure there is a standard of cleaning. We want assurance of that, and whether that's up to you or the, the owners of the building is, is obviously a, is a different uh, conversation. But it's just making sure that we've got the correct cleaning procedures in place. And I think I'm coming towards the end. So antibiotic prescribing. So for, for me, it's about, I suppose, be, becoming an, an antibiotic guardian. It's about thinking about this is in the community, it's in our hospitals, but it's also thinking about in the different contexts. Now, you're probably sitting there thinking, well, what on earth has a leg club got to do with an animal farm and what we're eating? But I suppose what I'm trying to say is it's just about that broadly, antibiotics aren't necessarily where they always think, where you think they are. It's not just about the ones that you're consuming through prescription. It's about what else we see that's out there in the industry, within health, within, within animal health. Um, and it takes 20 years on average to make an antibiotic. You can get to the 19th year of the hurdle and it can completely fail. So obviously what we're wanting to do is preserve, we're wanting to prescribe the right things with the right sensitivities to keep patients safe and for people to complete the course of their antibiotics most importantly. So just to show you a few pictures of Lee, this is our, our group of people. We've got a real mix of partnerships here. The lady bird in from the right is Julie Rooney. She was the person who wanted to set our... She was the driver of Leeds, basically. And we've got a social prescriber here, we've got volunteers, we've got uh, community nurses and practice nurses. 
And this is our, some of our lovely Bloomingdale people that we've got in Leeds who have all got smiles on their faces and it, the joy that we just get from seeing people that are so happy from coming into the leg club and having a piece of cake and the raffles, the raffles are amazing. Someone bought a courgette one week, someone won it and they went home and made a courgette cake and it got re-raffled the next week. <laughs> it was just amazing. I was like, wow, there's tomatoes from allotments, all sorts. So, you know, it, it, it's brilliant. What we want to do is we want to make a difference. Infection control is so important. Um, I know I'm the only one here. I know it's my passion. I hope it's your passion as well. Um, but it makes such a huge difference to patient lives. We don't want to get this wrong. We don't want patients to have that um, avoidable MRSA bacteremia that when we do a root cause analysis in, you know, we, we look back to see what, you know, what's gone on. We don't want that to happen. We need to make sure that we're keeping people safe. We need to make sure that it's absolute at the top of our radar. Um, and in, print, in conclusion, for me, the principles are about reinforcing safe quality care. It's protecting us, it's protecting our volunteers, it's about protecting our members. For us to understand the risk, I know it's a low risk. I know that we've already looked at sepsis, the risk is low, but it's still important. And what we don't want is that one person to be in our clubs. Um, we want people to be well informed. We want people to follow policy and guidance, but also to use their heads in terms of, you know, what the right thing is, individualising this patient care. We want the cleaning to be right. We want the environment to be right. And we want support from our local IPC team. So if you do one promise me today, it's to go back to your areas and have a conversation with your local IPC nurse, invite them along for a cup of tea, see what they think and build partnerships and hopefully we can see great things going forward. Okay.